Thank you, Samira, and thank you for, for inviting me to this seminar. This is my first time in Le Mans, although, as I mentioned, I uh, read ma mainly a lot of works from Le Mans. So uh, I, um, uh, I am a researcher now in Lyon, and so uh, my research focuses on uh, uh, studying high frequency uh, acoustic waves and phononics in uh, different micro and nano structures material, nanostructured materials. So what I'd like to show you today is basically uh, why we do that, why we are, what are the questions that we are trying to raise and understand with these uh, uh, frequencies and what type of materials we are working on right now. So what do I mean by high frequency, like high frequency waves? For me, this we are looking at uh, uh, at the frequency range between uh, from the megahertz to gigahertz, and, and so vibrations and elastic waves in this range of frequencies. And this is very useful for structures that have spatial features ranging from 100 microns down to the nanometer. So anything that has this type, any material that has this type of structure, it's very useful for us to, to study it with these uh, type of soft waves. And I can divide this in three categories. Usually what we do is either doing some kind of material characterization, mainly here looking, for example, at, at anisotropy and, and solids or looking at the rheology of, of soft solids hey, so, uh, at uh, high frequencies. Uh, another application for these type of phonons is bioimaging, and so uh, very useful for uh, also using mechanical properties as a contrast mechanism to, to image uh, living structures and living matter, and, uh, and also uh, designing, uh, designing devices to, that work in this range. Mainly, I'm talking about micro and nano electromechanical systems. These are structures, micro state structures that resonate, and we can use them for sensing or even to build filters. Saw, saw and or surface acoustic wave and bulk acoustic wave devices for communication and any kind of interaction with radio frequency waves because we are in the same uh, range of frequencies. So what I will be talking about, we, we were interested, so basically my studies and my studies, so this is uh, an overall picture of what we were looking for uh, at these past six years. Uh, and I can divide them into two categories. So first I will present a little bit what we've been doing with in the USA with uh, Nick Beckler on, on uh, monolayers of microspheres, looking at their dynamics and looking um, at how waves propagate in these structures. And uh, next, I will also show you recent uh, experiments and uh, investigations that we are pursuing uh, uh, on biological composites, okay? With different uh, motifs and different uh, architectures that we are looking at. So uh, first, let me start with this, with this uh, self-assembled study, studies that we've been doing. So I wanna mention that this was, this is like a, a very long time of studies that we've been doing now for the past decade. And it's uh, mainly led by Beckler Research Group now at UCSD. We were in the, at the University of Washington for some time. And also it was in collaboration with Alex Masner from MIT and uh, from with uh, Nicholas Vogel, who was the chemist who fabricated the, uh, who had a lot fabricate these structures for us, and he's at uh, in Germany. Okay, so so the motivation behind studying these structures, I can simplify it by saying that we've been trying to look at ways to design phononic materials at the micro scales that um, can actually overcome the limitations that we see with. Uh, classical structures that people design, uh, phononic designs at, at these scales. So here, here's a picture to summarize. So if we have a surface or a membrane, thin membrane, usually silicon, we, and we're looking at the dispersion uh, curve of this wave. Uh, so we're looking at surface waves type, Rayleigh type, Sezawa, which are guided waves, uh, layered uh, half-space type of waves, or LAM, 
uh, waves which are um, in membranes and uh, freestanding membranes uh, and we want to control these waves we usually do microfabrication techniques so we punch holes in the system or the structure or we put pillars and this is usually done with photolithography and we can control the dispersion curves by inducing band gaps due to periodicity or even due to local resonance here in the case of the pillars. Okay, so the, the problem or the drawbacks are the drawback from these, uh, these techniques is that they are, they are time consuming, they have a, a high cost and they're, they're also limited in large scale fabrication. I cannot maybe, I cannot, if I want to design a structure with a centimeter straight scale, it's going to take a very long time to do. So uh, we, we were looking at colloidal self-assembly as an alternative solution. So the way that we were doing uh, fabricating our structures, we were mainly using three type of self-assembly techniques which also I can put them in two categories. So the wedge cell technique and vertical deposition, basically what we do, we put a, a substrate between a wedge and we put a colloidal solution that would now evaporate and drag and the capillary forces would drag the spheres to the substrate like that and they would form a monolayer. It depends on the on this self-assembly technique and the quality of the technique we can uh, we can have disordered, we can have very well-ordered uh, monolayers of microspheres. Similar for vertical deposition, we've also been using that for, for uh, multi-layer stacking of monolayers. We were using this technique, but it follows the same principle. And also uh, the middle one was, it's a Langmuir blodgett type, or it resembles the Langmuir blodgett where we basically put uh, uh, here polystyrene spheres so they would float on water on a solution and we we come and scoop them with with uh, a membrane or a surface and we can have also perfect monolayers like that so um so once we have uh designed these structures we were looking at the interactions of these monolayers of microspheres with different types of waves so first example that we tried was putting them on a thin uh, a thin silicon membrane. This is one micron thick silicon membrane coated with aluminum on top and putting the spheres on top. And we're looking at LAM waves here. So guided in that membrane, what we saw was the interaction. So that is the uh, fundamental flexural mode of the membrane, A0. Uh, we saw uh, an interaction with the, with the resonance of the spheres uh, and it created a hybridization or an avoided crossing at this uh, point here. So the, this, the, the experiments that we were doing is, uh, is uh, a laser ultrasonics experiments. I'm not gonna go into details, but the idea is we can construct by focusing two pulsed lasers at the surface. We create an interference pattern. It's called transient grating spectroscopy. We can, this interference pattern would have a selected wavelength, um, acoustic wavelength and would create surface acoustic waves or guided waves in that case that would propagate at a fixed wavelength and we can measure this in the frequency domain, time domain, uh, sorry, and do an FFT and get the frequency response. So at every selected wavelength and we can do that for to build the whole dispersion curve. Okay, so that's how we can measure this. We measure uh, the diffraction of uh, the probe light and uh, this is how we are sensitive to the surface displaced. So uh, next also what we tried, so this was with, with the uh, LAM waves. We also tried looking at transmission of Rayleigh waves when we put these monolayers on surfaces, on half spaces, on, on, uh, on thick substrates. And we were exciting also surface acoustic waves, in that case Rayleigh waves, with, with also pulsed lasers. It was uh, here not interference pattern, so not only 1K excitation, but the broadband pulse and we were looking at the, a, the transmission inside with uh, different types of detection, interferometry or photo deflection. Uh, and uh, an example that we saw was in, the, in the transmission spectrum, we saw three different attenuation zones that we attributed also to avoid the crossings and hybridization with three different uh, resonant modes of the monolayer, the sphere monolayer. We, we went on and, and developed a, uh, um, a model, an analytical model to describe what we were seeing and what, what fitted well with our experiment was 
that we, uh, by, by, by connecting the spheres between them and to the substrate with, with springs, sheer and normal springs, uh, and I will also talk a little bit more about these springs later, but these springs account for adhesion. And so they are basically, um, they describe the contact mechanics of the spheres between them and to the substrate, and they account for adhesion as well. So what we found was that uh, what we were observing was a, a shear motion, mainly, that was the low frequency hybridization that we were seeing, a normal contact motion that was a square root K over M axial resonance, and a rotational. So this is shear dominated, this is more rotational dominated, but both have a shear and rotational component in that case. So these two modes, the lower one and the upper one, they mainly uh, uh, are dictated by the shear springs and the interparticle spring here. And uh, this one is, is only dictated by the normal spring. So that was um, six years ago, maybe now. And so we started to look at ways to, uh, to understand how we can tune these and control these, uh, these uh, spring stiffnesses, okay? So as I mentioned, they are contact, uh, contact modes, uh, contact-based resonance. So they are very sensitive to any kind of contact between the, the spheres. And so one way to, when we, we did in the beginning, and it was actually to identify which is which, is which we've, we've added a, uh, we started adding thin aluminum layers on top of the monolayer here. And so what we saw was a stiffening of the interparticle uh, spring that is connecting the spheres. So this stiffening resulted in an upshift of the, what we call the shear and the rotational modes, but the normal one was still the same. So this was a way for us to identify, but it's also a way to tune these type of resonances uh, with uh, nano contact tailoring. Uh, next, and this is where I want to focus a little bit more for this um, uh, presentation. We were thinking of how to, uh, how can we tune the, the normal contact resonance of the sphere, which is square root K over N. And K here, as I mentioned before, can be described or it, it results from the, it's a, a stiffness uh, that we get by linear, linearizing the force displacement curve that we uh, that uh, governs the the contact between actually that describes the contact between a sphere and a flat uh, surface so it's it's a hertzian contact where we have adhesion an adhesion term which is here to to the to to, to prescribe uh, the, the the dynamics or the here it's the force displacement at the, the at the micro scale and so as you can see this force displacement is as this term it's mainly the geometry of the contact and this is adhesion. So one way to tune that linearized stiffness is by either changing the contact or changing the adhesion. Changing the adhesion is hard, difficult to do. We tried. It's not very reliable. Uh, we can also actually add just added mass and downshift the frequency. But we wanted to mainly work on this term here, geometry of contact, and see if we can stiffen the system more. So what we did uh, was trying to create um, holes under each sphere. So when we used uh, silica spheres, these are two micron in diameter, and we, sh we, we illuminated the whole monolayer with a high power, large spot pulsed laser. So what happens when we do that is that we, the incident light will converge to a bright spot under each sphere. And this will melt or ablate the surface underneath. So we had here a titanium film that was 300 nanometer. And what we can have is basically a local heating of that titanium film. And we create some kind of nanoholes <coughs> under the spheres, under each sphere, okay? So we have this type of picture uh, there. And uh, we wanted to study what happens to the normal contact resonance when we had nano holes underneath of them. And uh, so we did use a detection, a grating interferometer detection, which usually is also a simple interferometer technique developed by Chris Gloria and Keith Nelson. Uh, and so the idea is that we come and split a, a probe into two beams with a phase mask, and one probe will be 
sensitive to the displacement and the other one will be the reference beam not sensitive and when they are reflected back and they interfere at the phase mask we can uh, uh, we can basically get an interferometric signal and we are mainly sensitive to the out of plane vibrations in that case okay so what we saw was uh, without microlensing and with microlensing in the time domain the frequency of resonance was shifted by a lot by three times so this is what we did here uh, we started playing with the power of the laser which created holes under the spheres so by changing the power, the fluence, we were able to shift from about, I would say 100 megahertz to about 200 megahertz by two times. And we also played, we fixed one power and started playing with number of pulses. And also by pulsing more, uh, this was a, a repetition rate here of one kilohertz pulse laser. Uh, we can also even go a higher upshift uh, in the frequency of resonance, which started at 100 megahertz. So this is the trend that we were getting, frequency versus pulse fluence. Here they ejected at these high powers, the spheres ejected, and number of fluence, we were also able to get a, an upshift for the frequency. We tried to understand what is going on here by looking at the, uh, at the structure, by peeling the spheres and looking underneath of them. What we saw is, as I mentioned, the holes formed were uh, increasing in, in the uh, area when the fluence was increased. So there is some kind of correlation that we, so we determined this area, the whole area as a function of the pulse fluence. And we saw a correlation between the augmented, the increased frequency and the, the pulse uh, fluence. We also actually looked, so this was uh, SEM images here. Uh, we also looked at AFM and what we found by measuring, like looking at the topography of each hole, we also found that uh, we built some kind of, uh, we had, we obtained some kind of built up rim around the sphere. And we saw that the built up rim was mainly done when we were pulsing a lot, but not when we were doing single shot. This was single shot illumination. This was continuous number of pulses, okay? And so we attributed this, we assumed that basically when we do continuous pulsing, it's basically kind of like the sphere is vibrating and digging more and like building material around of it. Okay, so we tried to, to find the relation between this and that, and that as well. And for this, we used what we call the Oliver and Farr model. So we didn't use the Hertz and contact model here because the idea is that we don't have a, a, a point contact anymore. We have a ring contact. So the sphere is sitting on a, on a ring now, <laughs> empty in the middle. And so we found in the literature that uh, this model is used for indentation uh, experiments where the indenter is axisymmetric. And usually it follows when we have a, an axisymmetric contact, it follows a, a, a general law that says that the stiffness of the contact is proportional to the square root of the area of contact, okay? And so what we did here, we uh, from that, we assume that we have a ring contact area and we measured from the whole area, we found, uh, we measured the, every time we were uh, basically measured, we measured the radius of contact that was changing with the fluence and we fixed DR, which is basically the built up material. We fixed that in that case. And here we varied DR and we fixed the radius. That's what we roughly found. We found that one time the area was changing. So the radius of the ring was changing and another time DR, which is the built up material was changing and the area was fixed. So when we did that and we used that ring of contact, we were able to, to uh, basically fit very well our experiments to that model where we found that we had a, uh, the relation between that area and the frequency of resonance scales with a power of one fourth. Okay, and so as you can see here, the black dots are the single shot measurement. We didn't go very high. The number of pulses increasing uh, made us go even higher. And this is built up material response here that we were seeing. Okay, and so this opens um, doors for tailoring the self-assembled monolayers locally. And so it's 
uh, this is something that we didn't pursue, but it was an idea that we were trying to also investigate more. By achieving this very uh, long range of shift of uh, frequency tailoring or nanocontact tailoring, we can now create um, gradients on the surface. And so we can make lenses, ultrasonic lenses, by just with the laser uh, basically shaping um, shaping the monolayer. So this is a simulation, it's unpublished here, but it's a simulation that we did where we changed the stiffness uh, on, uh, along that distance here from uh, what we could do 200 megahertz with single shot here to 100 megahertz. And we saw that we can focus 100 megahertz plane saws, plane surface acoustic waves with these type of gradient features that we have. Okay, so to summarize this first part of the talk, um, to summarize that, our conclusion is that we, so we've been working for a long time now uh, on these type of monolayers and uh, we, it, we, hope we kind of, we can say that we have developed a new class of what we call granular phononic materials, microgranular phononic materials at the micro scale. Their physics is richer than uh, the classical ones because they have contact <clears throat> resonance band gaps that we can tune in addition to if they are periodic and uh, our collaborators at MIT, they found this, if they are periodic at the micro scale, we can have Bragg and also we can have local resonance, which are the intrinsic spheroidal resonances of the spheres at higher frequency. So, so this introduced a contact-based functionality to control these phonons and so th these are self-assembled, so it's simpler to do. Uh, sometimes we were able to fabricate monolayers very fast in one day, not very hard now. Guaranteed, it's not the perfect monolayer, but we don't need order sometimes to see these effects. Just any disordered monolayer would do. They need to be monodispersed, maybe. Uh, and they can be non-linear non because uh, the contact mechanics is follows a Hertzian contact, which is nonlinear. We've never, though, observed a very nonlinear uh, non behavior at these scales because adhesion was very high for us. Always. Okay, so we tried a lot, but we did not. So that was the first uh, part. Next part is uh, mainly what we are working on. We started in the USA, also in collaboration with Sam uh, here and. Uh, this is also mainly the, the, the heart of my work now in Lyon, is looking at, um, at uh, phonomics of biocomposites uh, that are micro and nanostructured. So the questions that we are asking first is, so we find these motifs in nature, like we can class them in, in, in these type of motifs. And of course, there's a lot more, but. This is very common. You can find it in a lot of reviews, going from fibrous to layered, etc. And people have been exploring this in the static sense, uh, static mechanical design for a long time now. Uh, dynamically, at least experimentally, no one has been looking at that uh, very closely. We've been trying to understand what are the phonomic spectra of these. And can we control them? How do we control them? If, if that's possible, in order to, to design phononics from living structures, okay? So either tune them easier or just make them cheaper and more scalable and more affordable, etc. Okay, so I would show different classes of uh, structures that we are working on right now, but uh, all these are work in progress and uh, I don't have <laughs> conclusions to, to make at the end, but uh, I'll show you what we are working on right now. So I'll start with uh, this type of structures that we are investigating in plants. So plants are cellular, of course, and they are fibrous because they are made of a cell wall that is itself made of cellulose fibers. So they are fibrous materials and uh, they are cellular. Uh, this, this work is mainly done with my colleagues in, in, in ELM, uh, Tomadou and Martin Robin, who is a postdoc with us, also with Samuel and Louise here uh, in Le Mans, and in collaboration with Olivier Amon and, and Sana, uh, who is an engineer at uh, 
laboratoire de reproduction, développement des plantes in Lyon as well. Okay, so uh, the idea behind using plants to do uh, phononic design is is the richness of uh, plant composites and the richness of the ways we can control them. For example, I, I want to show you uh, the, the the two main uh, motivations is so first. The structures are very complex and are, are hierarchical. We can have from the tissue scale to the nano scale. In the tissue scale, we can have different uh, gradients and different structures. At the cell scale, we can find as well, the unit cell, we can find different motifs going from honeycomb-like structures or hexagonally, uh, hexagonally packed structures to, to puzzle cell walls. Um, and at the nanoscales, since these cells are made from cellulose, they, the cellulose fibers can rearrange also in different orientation, going from elongated in one direction to randomly distributed. This is the picture here. Also, what's interesting is that we can control these uh, structures either genetically. So this is a genetic modification of the structure of corn, stem cells in corn. And this, we can do also chemically and environmentally control the mechanical features. So this is just uh, a representation of the storage and loss model as a function. We can see transition, phase transitions, et cetera, and control these with, uh, with, with uh, uh, chemical agents or even just temperature, moisture, pH, et cetera, okay? So we wanted to kind of look if we can design structures uh, intentionally make structures that we we want to control for. So and this is based on the first study that we did, uh, where we took uh, onion cells, uh, we peeled that uh, layer here from a scale of onion, we peeled the layer. So that layer, it's called the epidermis. We deposited on a substrate. That epidermis, when we let it dehydrate overnight. We have a honeycomb structure that is emptied from the middle. So it's a honeycomb structure. Some people call it shoebox structure because we have the, it's like a shoebox. We have a base and we have walls around it. Uh, so what we did when we are breaking like that, splitting, we open the one layer of cells, we split it in half. And this always happens. And we can empty the whole vacuole and liquid content in the cell. And so we obtain something like this, dehydrated. And when we do profilo, profilometry on this, we can see that the height is micro, micro, micrometric and we have a base of two, three micron that usually doesn't change a lot. And so, so we wanted to test that also with laser ultrasonics techniques, also with uh, uh, point source excitation, broadband frequency spectrum. So what we did here, uh, a centered pump, and we did a scanning probe. So based on a setup developed by Hurley and Oliver Wright, we, we can actually scan in X and Y the probe. And this probe is, the detection is based on photo deflection. So uh, basically the slope of the surface would change the angle of the reflected probe. And that's how we see the surface acoustic wave. And so we can move that probe around the pump and measure the whole surface wave moving uh, at the surface. So that's what we did here. Uh, that's, a, that's a movie of, uh, of the detection that we can do. So this is the surface wave moving on the surface uh, glass, glass surface here. So the speed is the speed of railway waves, 3,000 meters per second around that, OK? Uh, so when we did that uh, on there, we can reproduce the uh, uh, dispersion curve of glass. Now this is, we have gold, a thin layer gold to transduce. So it's added mass. So that's why you can see a little bit of dispersion for the Rayleigh wave. Uh, but when we added uh, the organic layer or the onions, we saw some kind of attenuation zones. We call them band gap, but something here happening. And uh, um, we attributed this to, uh, so this is a filtered, uh, uh, a filtered image of the pulse at each frequencies. So we attributed this to the local resonances of the pillars. So these pillars that we saw in profilo, profilometry, when we look at their uh, eigen modes, eigen vibrations, we see that they fit uh, in that, uh, that gap. 
And so we said that uh, these local resonances were interacting with the surface acoustic waves and they're creating that band gap. Uh, and so we simulated that uh, in COMSOL. So this is a classical phenomenon that people have seen in, uh, at every scale, uh, even in the, when controlling uh, earthquakes with, with trees, people have seen that planting trees locally resonating, we can induce band gaps in railway waves. So now the additional part that we did, we took uh, different, uh, different uh, ages of plants. So going from the inner scale to the outer scale, the plant or the onion bulb would grow. And every time the plant grows, its structure changes with the age. So we can have very big or very high walls at the outermost surface and very small features at the innermost surface. So when we did that age, we saw a change in the height. Uh, and we measured the band gap at every time or the attenuation zone, I'm going to call it. Uh, so, uh, and we saw that this was changing with the height. And we were able to fit that with, a, um, uh, with simulations and also a C over 4 <coughs> L, so a, uh, a quarter wavelength resonance that was also kind of matching the trend more in the simulation, less in the experiments, because we have other features that we are not understanding right now, I'm trying to figure out, mainly also changes in mechanical properties as the cells grow, okay? So we also found that the band gap width was changing with the age, and we attributed this to the number of resonances that we are crossing, but also to the, Mainly here, we attributed this to the number of resonances, so number of pillars that we are crossing, okay? So the conclusion is that this frequency gap that we are seeing can be dependent on the growth stage of the, of the cells. Now, we try to go even further now. This is what we are now working on, so it's work in progress. We wanted to see if we can chemically tune these resonances or this band gap and uh, finely tune them as well. And so one, uh, one work or one idea that we are exploring now is uh, looking at chemical intervention that would change that. So what we do now, we take one scale, one onion scale from the same scale. We try different onions, okay, but we are always kind of uh, fixing a number of scale and taking from it. We are dipping this in a sugar solution. It's called sorbitol, alcohol sugar and uh, waiting for some time. And we are peeling this and doing the same experiment, okay? So we did this on six different onions. What we saw, so in, on six different onions, but in every onion we were doing like also a lot of measurements. But what we saw, uh, what we saw in, in, in on average is that so the, this central frequency of the attenuation zone was of course, changing a, a lot uh, from onion to onion. That is a biological variability that we are not able to control for now, but we tried to normalize with, with respect to that biological variability. So when we normalized with uh, the zero concentration, so this zero concentration means pure water. And uh, when the other concentration is when we added the sugar, we saw a trend, okay? Now this trend is up to a debate that we are still working on to, uh, to figure out, but we see, uh, we see a, a, a decrease of 10% in the frequency, okay? And when we compare the height of the fillers, we don't see that. This doesn't follow what we usually saw with, the, with what we've seen before. So, so here it's more kind of uh, constant. And so usually if the frequency decreases, then the height of the pillar should increase. And we don't see an increase here, at least not clear. Now, 10% is a small shift, but in literature, we can find similar shifts when we are doing the similar treatment. The idea is that, so this was done in AFM on hydrated cells. And so the idea is that when we put sugar in the environment of the cell, it will create an osmotic shock. So the cell would empty its water, okay? And the water would flow from the inside to the outside of the cell. Now, when the cell is in the pure water condition, 
uh, the the pressure the pressure inside the cell is exerting a very high it's the highest and it's exerting attention on that cell wall and people have seen that when we add more concentration and create osmotic shocks we are kind of loosening the cell wall so it's like a balloon that we are loosening and people have been trying to understand this and they say that there is a nonlinear elastic uh, response for the cell wall and that depends on the pressure the osmotic pressure inside the cell. And they saw shifts on the order of 10 to 20%. Now, of course, this is up to a debate, but this is a route that we are taking for now. The other uh, not so well uh, looking trend is the deviations that we are seeing. But each point, it's not only one measurement, it's about three or four measurements. Each point is one only. Even though we normalize, we are still seeing a, uh, a big deviation. That could also come from our identification, the mode identification, because sometimes the picture is not so beautiful like that. We are seeing a lot of modes. It's hard to understand what is happening uh, due to the complexity of the structure. But we are working uh, mainly with Wies and Sam to kind of figure out what's the best way and using Slatko technique from uh, developed by, by Jean-Philippe to understand more how we can identify these modes and these complex uh, structures, okay? So um, this is where we are here. Now, the next thing that we are pursuing in parallel is the anisotropy of the cell wall. As I mentioned, it's highly anisotropic because it's made of fibrous uh, cells, okay? so. When we did uh, the image, the 2D image, we saw that at some frequencies we were seeing transmission along some directions, but not in the others. We attributed this to a band gap directionality that was changing. And we don't know what's the response, what's the effect of the structure itself. The structure is a hexagonal pack or honeycomb structure, but also the material is anisotropic. So we wanted to kind of also understand the anisotropy. Are we taking the right parameters? We were here using, um, we were using the properties of wood because this is dehydrated cells. And we were using properties that people measure in wood structures and biologists are not happy with that. But biologists usually, uh, biologists usually measure these with hydration uh, states. Okay, so this is a completely different story when we dehydrate the structure. I thank everyone. So many people, many teams. Uh, ELM is uh, where I am right now with Tomado and uh, Marta and Jeremy. We're working. Uh, Long, Samuel and these UC San Diego. A lot of people. Nicholas Beckler mainly. Other students that I work clo closely with that are now everywhere. And the plant guys, people that are in Lyon as well. The plant project now we have, uh, it's funded by INF under two uh, grants that we are, this is about to start, this is already started. And the Naker and Mentorship project also with Professor Espinoza in Northwestern. And this year also I wanna thank Journal de Nike, who they chose our, our study to put in their, uh, in their journal. And that's it. Thank you.